Hello and welcome back to the second part of our seminar titled Chatting Devices, Introduction to Networking and Communication Protocols for Use with HVAC and BAS Controls. Okay, in part one, we went over how humans talk to devices or H to M, human to machine, communication. In part two, we're going to be looking at how devices talk to each other and the various different networks that they use to talk to each other. And we're going to try to get some introductory level of familiarity with some of the main networks that are used for device to device communications. So as I mentioned in part one, I like to use analogies to take the known and bridge it over to the unknown. <clears throat> so the best analogy or one of the analogies that I came up with uh, to try to communicate how machines talk to machines is using a network, a, a railroad network analogy. So I want you to think about this uh, with me for just a minute with regard to trains and the whole train industry, the railroad industry. So you can basically break down the railroad industry into three different areas. You have train protocols, you have train transport or trains transportation requirements, and then you have train translation requirements. Uh, train protocols would be things like the design and the implementation of the actual train engines, uh, the various different cars that are involved, or the train cars that are involved, and the different uh, types of cars. Also, things like the various different companies, uh, the various different companies' policies that they utilize. Uh, the coordination, if you have more than one company sharing a common track, then there has to be coordination. That all comes under the umbrella of protocols, and protocols need to be developed to accomplish those things. But you also need a system of tracks. And you can't just go through and lay tracks. In addition to tracks, you have to have stations where the trains are able to stop. You have to have switches to get you on and off of different tracks. So you have the transport piece of that, that network, <clears throat> that railroad network uh, protocol. So, uh, and the third is translation. Uh, there needs to be a format to be able to communicate between railroad owners, even in the case of Europe, uh, international, different languages, but there needs to be um, a, a set of rules and the ability to translate uh, between these various different languages so that these railroad managers and railroad owners are able to actually communicate with each other. So the same thing is true with machine to machine networks. You have data protocols, data transport and data translation. Data protocols basically has to do with the various different predominant languages that are used. Um, data transport has to do with the tr transmission methods, how the tracks, so to speak, how do we get from point A to point B and beyond? What type of network infrastructure do we have to have? <clears throat> and data translation involves things like gateways, data pumps, hardware platforms, software platforms, uh, one being the Niagara uh, framework, which we will look at a little bit more later. So let's go ahead and look now at the individual uh, item of, uh, the, of data protocol. So a data protocol is a combination of a control language and a number of rules. Again, a good analogy for this is this actual presentation. Now, imagine that this was a live presentation as opposed to a video presentation. In a live presentation, <clears throat> the protocol that we follow is a combination of a number of, of a, a spoken language, in this case, English. It's not multi-language. It's not being presented multilingual at this point. It is, it is English. And in addition to the language that we are using, there's a number of unwritten rules. For instance, in a presentation mode, we all sort of understand <clears throat> that the presenter speaks, 
and everyone else listens. That there should be no talking unless the presenter calls on you. That the presenter is able to modify the rules, but that the listener doesn't have the right to modify the rules. So that, that's just a good example of what a data protocol would look like. <clears throat> In addition to that, there's, there's different network topologies that have developed over time. The most predominant current network that is utilized in building automation systems and HVAC controls right now is a network called BACnet. BACnet stands for Building Automation Control Network. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time on these different networks, but I want to introduce you to the major networks that are still uh, coming into play in uh, building automation industry. In addition to um, the BACnet network, there is LAWN network. LAWN is pre predominantly um, a licensed network, a proprietary network that's, that was uh, originated by the company called Echelon. And over time, at one point several years ago, LAWN was the predominant control language that was used in building automation. <clears throat> Since that time and up to this present time, LAWN has gradually been phased out and BACnet has taken over as the predominant network protocol. Modbus is another player. Uh, Modbus has been around for a very long time. It's used much more in the industrial process and the, and the PLC world than it is in the building automation world. And then there's a whole bunch of different proprietary networks. Johnson Controls, for instance, has their own network. It's called the N2 network. Uh, Train, another manufacturer of HVAC equipment, has the COM, what they call the COM3 and COM4 uh, protocols. And so you can see that there's a number of different languages, just as we have a number of different languages and unwritten rules that go with those languages. The same thing is true in terms of how devices talk to other devices and the different ways that they do that. Now, we also need to look at the various different topologies that fall under the, under the data protocols, uh, communication rules category. So there's primarily two different topologies that are in use today. There is a master-slave topology and there's a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology. Now, there are pros and cons to each one of these. And again, we won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but some of you have heard the term BACnet MSTP. The MSTP in BACnet MSTP stands for Master Slave Token Passing. And we'll talk about the token passing later. So in a BACnet MSTP network, you can see that there is a master and that the master communicates back and forth independently with each one of the slaves. And, um, and so one of, the, one of the advantages to this type of a protocol is that it's very efficient. You don't have everybody talking at the same time. It's very stable and it's pretty easy to troubleshoot. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that it's master dependent. If you remove the, the master from the equation, for whatever reason, communication break, uh, some of the lines are broken, whatever, you completely stifle the entire system because none of the slaves have the ability to, to speak with each other or to communicate with each other. So besides the master-slave topology, we have the peer-to-peer -to -peer topology. In a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology, Everyone is on an equal plane. There are no masters, there are no slaves, they're all peers. And the peers have the ability to talk to more than one individual in the room. So you can see, just by nature of uh, the graphic representation here, that it's gonna be much quicker. Uh, information doesn't have to be passed through anybody to anybody else. Uh, so it, it really forms what we would call a, a mesh capability with this type of, of protocol. One of the uh, drawbacks, or a couple of the drawbacks of this, is that a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology uh, tends to be less stable 
And when something goes wrong, it becomes really a lot harder to troubleshoot than when you're working uh, with a uh, master-slave topology. Now, at this point, I'd like to do kind of an imaginary exercise so you can help, uh, that, that will help you to understand uh, what is going on sort of behind the scenes in some of those unwritten rules that we talked about. And uh, this particular one talks about passing the token. Now, um, I want you to imagine, since we're in a video format, a remote video format, we're not really able to do this in a, in a session like I would normally uh, want to do. So you're going to have to kind of use your imagination on this. So these are the rules. You may not talk unless you have the token. When you're handed the token, you have 30 seconds to pass it to the next student. And when you get the token, you can do one of three things. You can ask a question of the mentor, you can make a statement to the mentor, or you can pass the token without comment. But again, you only have 30 seconds to do that, and then you have to pass the token. So again, thinking about this imaginary exercise on the next slide here, we're looking at passing the token. The same thing occurs basically in a BACnet MSTP network. The master has to initiate all conversations, all communications. The slave has the opportunity to when they when they receive the token they have the opportunity to communicate or to just simply pass that token back to the master which in then passes the token to the next slave or servant when you get the token when they get the token they're able to either transmit important information or just simply pass it directly back so you can see a similarity between the exercise that we just went through and how the communication process takes place with this token passing type of network. Now let's move on to the transmission modes. Again, think with our analogy with, uh, that it's a data transmission is similar to the train tracks, the switches, the stations, the actual thing where the, the metal meets the track, if you will. One of the transmission modes is uh, the use of Ethernet. Ethernet basically uses a Category 5E or a CAT6 cable with multiple twisted pairs, in this case four pair of twisted wires in the same cable. The, there are different speeds that it operates at, T-Base 10, T-Base 100, utilize only two pair in that cable of the four pair. But a, a gigabit connection utilizes um, all four pair of the wires in that CAT5E or CAT6 cable. The cable is unshielded. It does depend on the use of Ethernet switches. Um, there are some, some would say that there are device limits of uh, less than 254 devices. Um, one of the restrictions is that the maximum cable length between switches and between devices is limited to 300 feet. The topology that is used with this type of wiring is called a star or a star matrix topology. Another transmission mode is twisted shielded pair. With a twisted shielded pair, there are two or three conductors in each cable we call this an RS-485 serial communication standard. The various data rates extend everything from 9600 baud to 76000 baud rates. Um, the cable typically does need to be shielded and you need to have end of line resistors to balance out the, the uh, communications network. There are uh, device limits between 30 and 240 depending on the transceiver load and again we won't go into detail about that but note the difference in the maximum cable length of a twisted shielded pair network you're limited to 4,000 feet rather than the 300 foot limit of Ethernet 
So you can see it, that a twisted shielded pair network would lend itself better to say a multi-story building with VAV boxes on each floor. There's a, there's a good possibility with that cable length that you'd be able to communicate and network all of those devices uh, within that 4,000 foot cable restriction. Obviously, another uh, network protocol or transmission mode is wireless. And within the wireless realm, there are a number of different individual uh, methods of wireless communication. We're just going to look at, at five of these because these are the five that are used predominantly in the building automation and the HVAC uh, industry. The most predominant or the, the main one that we look at is the Wi-Fi wireless network. Wi-Fi stands for wireless fidelity. The transmission rates vary and the range varies, but typically your maximum length, um, again, you can overcome this some ways, but as a general rule, you wanna make sure that these devices are within uh, 30 to 300 feet in terms of the spacing from each other. The second wireless method that is used is Zigbee. Zigbee establishes um, what we call a mesh network similar to the peer-to-peer -to -peer topology that we looked at. One of the advan advantages of Zigbee is that it's low power compared to Wi-Fi. It's low, lower powered that the devices have the ability to sort of go to sleep or go into some kind of a quasi sleep. So there's more less power consumption on those devices in order to maintain the network communications. But they also have their limits in terms of the space because it is a low powered network. You're limited to between 40 and 120 feet in terms of your range. <clears throat> now, the next one is an ocean and it is even a lower powered uh, wireless system. It operates in the sub millihertz frequency range and it's limited to about 100 feet. Finally, you have the, the, the final two that you have on the list here is Bluetooth, which we're familiar with because uh, many more devices than building automation devices utilize Bluetooth. Again, it's a low power a wireless network that has a range of about 40 feet in general. And the final one that we're going to look at is NFC or near field communication. Literally, you only have a one inch range and it's ultra low power. And we'll explain that before we're all, all done here. So briefly, let's just look at Wi-Fi. So with a wireless network, <clears throat> and these are these are VAV controllers that we are looking at here. And I have an example of one of these same VAV controllers with me here. And so you can see that this, this uh, particular controller uh, matches the one that is represented in the diagram here. You can see that there's a number of ways to make this controller communicate wirelessly. You can either use a BACnet router uh, that, that converts a BACnet two-wire twisted shielded pair MSTP network into a wireless signal, or you can get a wireless uh, access point attachment for one or more of these devices. But basically these devices are connected to a network uh, through a Wi-Fi, a standard Wi-Fi network. Now Zigbee, as I mentioned before, is a mesh network. So each one of the advantages of a mesh network is that each sensor isn't relying on just transmitting back to the central server. <clears throat> it is capable of transmitting its message through other sensors back. So if you get a data loss in one route, you're able to go perhaps a different route to be able to communicate between the most distant sensor and the central server. It is a low powered network. One of the disadvantages of Zigbee is that it, it uses literally the same bandwidth and the same channels as Wi-Fi. So if you have a lot of Wi-Fi network activity going on in your building, 
then the Zigbee traffic is competing with that as well. The other disadvantage is that you have uh, some pretty serious uh, distance, transmission distance limitations. And Notion is another wireless method that is becoming more and more popular. So a Notion <clears throat> devices are ultra low powered. So they, with a lithium battery, you may be able to have a sensor on the wall last literally communicate for two to three years with a lithium battery. The sensors that are pictured here actually have a little photo cell in them, so they recharge themselves. And they're so low power that, that they literally uh, only have to have a very little bit of light to, to be powered. So you can see that this enables you to be able to um, have sensors that don't even necessarily have to have any, any batteries or any physical connection whatsoever. And finally, we've got uh, Bluetooth that uh, we're all familiar with, with regard to the various different accessories that are available. For instance, our, our smartphone and um, some of these controllers actually have built-in Bluetooth and you can load a smartphone application and be able to communicate right from your smartphone to that specific device. Here's an example of how these Enotion sensors are tied into a VAB controller. So you've got the access point that is connected to the VAB and then the low powered Enotion sensors just communicate to that access point. Now near field communications is one of the most recent wireless technologies. And again, it's very, very specialized. It's pretty amazing in that if you have a if you have a smartphone that has near field communication capabilities, you can literally you can literally take and load the application. In this case, I don't have the application with KMC because it has to be licensed, but you can literally take the application, start the application up, and whether this controller is inside of the box that it came in or whether it's outside of the box, all you have to do to communicate and to link with this controller is literally get this phone within one inch of the device itself. At that point, you're able to literally go in and com completely load a configuration profile, interrogate the operating parameters. You can go in there and establish an individual Mac address and IP address for each one of your controllers, a device ID. So you can literally, without even taking brand new controllers out of the box, you can literally pre-configure these to go out to the job site so that once the technicians loop them all together or wire them all together, theoretically, they would all come up and be able to talk to each other because they all have individual unique addresses. So near field communication technology is, is really quite astounding. Here's an example of the KMC application and what it looks like. Now, uh, let's talk for a minute about gateway devices or bridges. When you look at data protocols, you have to look at translation at times. So, in the same way that when you have two people that speak two different languages, you have to have a translator or one or the other needs to have the ability to, have, to be able to translate. In this case, we see that you've got Modbus, which is a separate language from BACnet. Note that uh, these gateway devices allow these two separate languages to be able to talk together. Now, a gateway can either be a hardware device uh, here's, here's, the, here's an example of a gateway that takes BACnet MSTP and converts it to BACnet IP. So it's the same language, but two different transmission protocols. There, you can also buy gateways that convert different languages, such as Modbus and BACnet. There are also, there are also frameworks. Uh, let's just take a quick look at the Niagara and Sedona frameworks. So if you notice from the graphic here, 
You've got three separate languages. You've got BACnet, LAWN, and Modbus. None of those languages can talk to each other. You could install gateways that would allow these languages to talk to each other, but a better approach is often to take each one of those up to a common language platform. And that's exactly what the Niagara framework does. Now, Niagara is becoming uh, very popular in the building automation industry, so popular that it's similar to the effect that Microsoft Windows has um, on, the, on the general com computing community. <clears throat> in this case, the Niagara framework is becoming the Microsoft Windows of the building automation industry. Many of the major DDC controls manufacturers have integrated this into their product and they're now being embedded in edge devices. In addition, under data translation, you can do data pumping. There's more and more of an emphasis in the industry on what we call analytics. And that is where we take the data in large amounts and pump it up to a central location where that data is then processed and analyzed. And so here you can see a, re a graphic representation of where we have a BACnet data source. It might be the building's building automation head end, which communicates into a facility management and maintenance software package uh, via a haystack data pump. And so here, with, with that big data being able to be processed at the facility level and at the global level, centralized level, um, you're able to do things like uh, massive amounts of trending, alerts, predictive analytics, and even uh, producing preventative maintenance task assignments. So that's a look at the various different networks and protocols that we have for devices to talk to each other. So in this seminar, first of all, we looked at how people talk to devices or H2M communication. And then we looked at how devices talk to other devices or M2M communication. I wanna thank you for your participation in this workshop. We really appreciate the time that you have taken to be able to spend with us today. And on behalf of HVAC Excellence, I just thank you again for this opportunity to present this information to you. Thank you.